to day four of the Plunk Conference 2021. And I am so pleased to have Alan Runyon, co-founder of Plone, founder of Enfold Systems, a venerable Plone service provider in, I guess it's Houston, right? Texas. It's uh, one of those, I don't know where you are, but you've been doing great things for Plone. Well, actually creating Plone for hmm, 20 years now. So with, uh, with me is Alan Runyon, who is going to talk about using Plone as a backend for an app. And I am very keen to hear what he has to say about it. Take it away, Alan. Can you hear me? Fantastic. All right. All right, guys. So um, thank you. I wish it's very strange. I've never done any sort of uh, conference speaking over the uh, the internet it feels weird not being able to see people's faces and reactions. Um, so we've been working on a app, um, a cross mobile app for a number of months, uh, probably like eight months. And it's uh, been a pretty long journey. And so um, I wanted to share my thoughts around what it was like to go on this journey uh, building a cross mobile uh, app that Plum was being used as the backside and to sort of discuss some of the things um, that we found along the way. Uh, it was a very long, um, it was a very long <laughs> uh, uh, transition for our team. Um, so uh, it was a, a basically sort of why we did this. Um, we chose the Flutter framework and uh, we've been building this app. We've had the, the server side portion um, for quite some time. And um, uh, the application that we had been using for these end user devices, um, there were a variety of them. Um, basically stopped uh, adhering to some of the security requirements. And so um, we had to build a, a mobile app that was going to solve that um, or the project wasn't gonna be able to uh, continue. Um, and so the core team that we had, um, uh, we had uh, some contractors in the beginning to help sort of set us on our path, actually some Zope luminaries, um, but really had never really built any sort of large mobile application. So this was a complete sort of, we didn't know what we were gonna know, we didn't know, we just sort of started, um, you know, bite size. We had, you know, uh, junior developers that took months to, sort of spin up, building little tiny apps, building small prototypes of things. Um, and I mean, it really was a, a, a large transition for the company and it's taken an enormous amount of energy. Um, and so I'm hoping, unfortunately I can't see anyone, but um, I'm hoping to sort of be able to be a little bit more interactive. I guess maybe this format's not really made for that. Um, or it's a little bit harder, much harder to do. <laughs> um, and well, the big picture is that this customer has a sort of mix of devices, both Android and iOS, um, on a variety of different um, sizes. So you have tablets and mobile devices, uh, uh, iPhones and Samsung devices. And they're basically getting data to and from their devices into Plone. Um, the workflow typically works where people are seeding a bunch of content inside a phone and then uh, these people being able to select different uh, containers to be able to synchronize. And these containers have sort of deeper hierarchies in it. Um, uh, what, makes, what makes this even more challenging is that um, you know, we had, you know, the, the design constraints were 
we couldn't have any sort of SaaS or or any sort of offering that could help we could help uh, alleviate some of the pain, everything has to be self-hosted in GovCloud. And essentially either we self-host it or not even us really self-hosting it. I mean, this is a whole nother process of getting applications spun up. So there was limitations in, in that. Um, and this application, even though it's, it's gonna be running for the government and they're going to be synchronizing data back and forth, um, if this is a success, there's going to be an awful lot of certification to the code base. Um, and so we had to sort of develop and, and think about what mechanisms will we have going forward to provide you know, um, certification um, and some security audits. So initially it's a pretty small group of people, it's about 15,000 devices. Um, we could mark it by success if we get it onto about 40,000 devices. And the ceiling, the maximum number of devices, we would see that this, this application being on is probably between 300 to 500,000. Um, we also, again, did this for the team that didn't know pretty much very much about mobile app development. So there was a lot of spinning up and, um, and that the other side is that this is, users are completely offline. There is no connectivity. There is basically a point in time where the sync occurs over you know, even variable bandwidth, and then the users go away for long periods of time, um, viewing information, annotating PDFs, or, or editing or adding information on these devices to later be pushed back up. So, we're looking into how we're going to build this thing. And um, we sort of threw out Zamarian pretty quickly. Um, it didn't seem like something that was going to fit us. Um, and uh, React Native, you know, they, they don't really have, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive community. React Native is sort of like this framework, or at least the way that I was understanding it is this framework and there's, it does all these different things, but there's components all over the place. It's not sort of a cohesive experience. Um, and because there's a sheer, just huge, huge surface area of third-party libraries, that dependency management's just difficult. Um, and obviously, you know, we with, with such a large code base for this kind of app, with this engineer, this, this sort of um, staff engineer, um, JavaScript, what more we'd need to use TypeScript, and then even then it would probably be um, a, a bunch of other bootstrap stuff that uh, or sort of safety harness infrastructure would have to have around us. So we picked Flutter because of Dart. Um, and uh, it's cross-platform. Uh, Dart is statically typed. Um, and that makes things much, much easier. Um, we did some analysis around FIPS. This is gonna be possible. Um, the certification process is a whole other ordeal. Um, it's modern, it's uh, reactive, and has all sorts of you know, uh, generics and enclosures and, 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 and it's sort of async first. It has all the different mechanisms you need. Um, and Google, while they're not necessarily known for you know, great feedback, they seem to be taking a very different sort of, you know, uh, as of whenever we came into it um, a year and a half uh, ago, they, they seem to be very sort of user ex, uh, developer experience driven. And that uh, I think really does show off quite a bit. Um, uh, React Native, there was not really a way of supporting uh, client certificates you know, as a first class um, part of the networking stack uh, without sort of doing a bunch of stuff. And then that wouldn't really work with all the other libraries and it was pretty difficult. And then um, a really nice bonus, um, which is uh, first class obfuscation. Um, and uh, 
this is something that would be incredibly helpful uh, in during deployment and distribution. So Flutter is a, a GUI toolkit that is written in the programming language Dart, as I was saying, it's statically, uh, it's, it's statically typed. Um, it's kind of the complete opposite of Python. Um, there is zero runtime reflection. Um, everything must be done up front and designed in. Um, and that took some getting used to. Um, and even in my days of Java, we were using sort of you know, runtime uh, type information to do uh, things. But in this world, there's, there's, there's none of that. So everything has to be developed has to be sort of designed out. Um, but Dart as a language is fairly interesting. It's sort of asynchronous, client-facing language, um, really sort of geared towards uh, writing, you know, basically really good for mobile apps or, or web apps. Um, the history of it, if anyone is not familiar, is that it originally started as a mechanism to replace JavaScript, I believe in Chrome, um, or at least that's the rumors. And then after everyone hearing that Google was thinking about this, you know, that sort of fell apart. And then Dart was being used to generate uh, transpile into JavaScript. And, um, and it runs uh, fairly large chunks of complicated uh, uh, JavaScript code that, that's being, Loaded into browsers, I think on the Google Ads, is um, one of the key thing, one of the key mechanisms that is using uh, is 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 using uh, the Dart transpi uh, transpiler. Um, so from a so the language comes in sort of multiple runtime versions. There's a uh, a compiler that, uh, that 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 compiles down into platform specific binary. You have a virtual machine that's like Python that can run and um, has a lot more sort of uh, looseness to it because it's sort of it's it's not a compiled uh, it's com not completely compiled, and then you have the, the JavaScript transpiler. Um, it's got all the primitives that you would need. The language I think is about ten plus years old. Um, and it's really come into its own after uh, Flutter has been sort of the toolkit that um, was being, uh, that, that they were sort of, Dart was driving the Flutter toolkit. Um, and it's quite ergonomic. You can work in it, works really uh, pretty well and, and, and doesn't, it's not hard to, uh, not excessive typing, it's inferred typing. And, and stuff like that. So um, again, so you know, if, if I wasn't clear, Flutter is sort of this UI toolkit. Look at this. Flutter is the toolkit. Uh, the Dart programming language is the sort of utilizer uh, enabler, and then you have sort of the platforms, and then your app is built sort of kind of like HTML would be built in a web app. Your, your app basically, you know, creates, you know, pages that look like um, nested blocks of, um, you know, nested blocks of, of, of code blocks that represent uh, a, a, a hierarchical uh, page, uh, widgets that would be composed on a page. Um, and but Flutter actually itself isn't really the big problem. <laughs> um, you can sit down with Flutter and get going and it's pretty impressive demo. Um, you can do fairly advanced things, especially with the libraries. Um, if you're having a SaaS based uh, software, um, we were doing some pretty cool things with Hazura very quickly. Um, but um, you know, in, in our world, unfortunately, uh, we're going to be doing a bunch of um, platform specific stuff, um, platform specific being mobile de mobile device sort of subsystem coordination. And that requires sort of 
using lots of different languages. So on the Android side, there's Kotlin and Java. And on the iOS side, there's Swift Objective-C. Um, and now you don't have to do lots of this, but there was enough of it, uh, especially considering what we're doing, the nature of sort of offline file synchronization that you have to do um, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of Swift and Objective-C. And Dart actually is, um, because Flutter and the way that Dart works uh, on Android, you can get away without doing a whole ton of Kotlin, unlike on uh, iOS, but you know, you really had to kind of, um, you still have to have some Kotlin or some Java experience. You have to reach into native APIs and that's just how it's going to be for um, from time to time. Um, also, you know, like any sort of complicated framework or subsystem or integration system, you know, how do you test this? I mean, there's just a, a huge question mark. You know, we can test our code, but testing the integration between these is that's not really a, like, not really doable, um, or at least well, we couldn't find a way. Um, then inside of mobile development, the native components that are written in Kotlin and Swift they're managed with a whole sort of separate system called Cocoa Pods and Gradle. And uh, Flutter will actually sort of drive those, um, those dependencies. So it's quite nice. I mean, I, I presume uh, all the other mobile app development systems do that as well, where you don't have to go to each one of them and, and change uh, and, and actually say, okay, update my, my, my base components here and update my base components there and then go back to your language that you're using and then update your dependencies there. Um, but unfortunately, setting it all up, getting used to it, it's again, another set of stuff that you have to learn. And it has, you know, weird syntax, different ways of laying out paths. Um, and then if you're writing any sort of native stuff, you have to become sort of a little bit aware of those, um, those systems. Um, in, also in mobile development, which I really didn't quite realize that we don't really have a parallel in the web world is just how inconvenient the development experience is. Now, again, we're really new to this. Um, so really basic things like reading SQL light off a, off a device. Um, I mean, essentially what you have to do is, you know, build a SQL light web browser, which fortunately there already ex exists such a thing in Flutter, but, you know, there's no just sort of, SSHing into an iOS device and, and uh, running SQLite from the command line. Um, unfortunately, it's not like that. Um, also, the development and sort of testing experience is kind of inconsistent because we typically run on emulators. Um, those are not actual devices and due to instruction sets and what's available, um, uh, and, and what's available for different subsystems and how the behavior works is just different. Um, that's, that's, and it's also different in different ways across Android emulator works. And this has these quirks and iOS emulator has these quirks. Um, so at this point, we sort of are getting our mind around this. We're getting some expertise. We've become, you know, writing our, our, our you know, a, a little small app for a, a customer, bringing it through the sort of development process and testing process. And in the, in the same time, we're in parallel, we have this larger file sync app uh, that's being developed. And um, uh, we're sort of cutting our teeth on it and we're feeling pretty good um, our code reviews are going pretty well. Um, you know, uh, testing sort of comes in and out of the picture as we focus on different things for the junior developers to work on. Um, and as the design sort of iterates on the file synchronization app, um, tests are changing as well. But, but that core part is, is pretty easily tested, there's basically algorithms around synchronizing and there's sort of very specific boundaries that we're going to be 
taking ingesting data from and 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 then we can sort of stub those things out and and really write uh, decent tests and there's a there's a there's a great test framework um, as well um, and mocking library and stuff for flutter um, uh, again so we have the server side uh, version of this app that's going clone is operating as a web dev server yes if you are familiar with clone desktop this is eerily similar sort of uh, resemblance um, we use OIDC. Uh, Typic for us specifically, we're using mod open IDC and OAuth 2. Um, if anyone has any feedback around using OIDC natively in Flown, please let me know. And in the server side, there's you know several terabytes of data. There's not too many writes, um, but there's tons of reads. And when I mean that, I'm talking about 20,000 devices synchronizing fairly large uh, collections of data lots of prop finds oh and also huge chunks of these devices do it all in a very small part of time uh, or short period of time between pretty much almost i would i i would have to double check this but at least 40 or 50 percent of the activity happens in 90 minutes um so there's tons of reads that happen in a very short period of time <clears throat> um so we chose WebDAV. We chose WebDAV because we couldn't really find another standard that well, Plone was going to be able to talk to or that we could make an API for Plone um, that was going to support basically, hey, you know, um, what folders have changed? Uh, what, what you know, uh, uh, give me a list of items and folders. Give me items, of, give me information on an item, delete, move, add, um, and, uh, and uh, rename. And well, so S3 would be pretty okay. Um, but that means we would have to implement S3 for Plone. Um, and really, what we're getting there is chunks, uh, chunking, and sort of a more modern dealing with large files. Our files aren't super large. Um, we have lots of files, but the, probably the max size of file is going to be about 15 megabytes. Um, there are the one-off ones that are 100 megabytes, but those are pretty fair, pretty rare. Um, but nothing on the order of, you know, Docker containers or something like that, where it's you know, 10, you know, hundreds, hundred megs, or or an even imploding container land that's, you know, gigabyte or something like that. Um, so um, if anyone has any ideas, I am coming here to ask, ask for ideas, what other sort of APIs would be useful um, that you would be able to have on a mobile, mobile device trying to sort of synchronize with a, a server side. Um, it has to be over HTTP because of uh, the sort of constraints that we're dealing with, but really couldn't think of anything. There's web dev, there's actually another um, specification called web dev collections, which seems to be pretty, pretty interesting. Um, either web dev collections or web dev syndication. I can't remember which one, but there's another, there's, there's two web dev, um, drafts and the more recent one, which is still pretty old is, uh, the one that I'm talking about. Um, and so we have been working on a prototype using Guillotina web dev uh, with OpenIDC and using S3 storage for serving uh, binary files out of, um, currently we're using with Plone, you know, the sort of typical rel storage with NFS using EF, uh, Elastic File System, which is the AWS um, uh, NFS uh, mechanism. And that's expensive. Um, Pretty robust, works well, but uh, not ideal. Um, so um, that's sort of the, the 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 side of the mobile app development, and when we're uh, and then the sort of the server side, when we are talking about Flutter and sort of what we've the experience of what parts that we really like about it. 
is that the UI UX development is super duper fast. Um, it didn't take the junior developers very long. Um, they had a little bit of Angular experience, both of them. Um, before they came in, they had done, uh, I think, uh, maybe a three week project. Um, so they were coming in from that point of view, but it was pretty quick for them to um, be productive in uh, the UX. Um, but obviously, if you're not familiar, if you're not, uh, um, if you're sort of just thinking about things from HTML and CSS point of view, without sort of, um, uh, you, can, you can actually draw the UI very easy. It doesn't require almost any skill, just, you know, just what you know with HTML and CSS, it's just syntax. Um, and then you can do hot reloading, just like sort of a web page. And it, you can get very, very far from the UI UX. And it's one of the reasons why I think you see awful lot of Flutter UX sort of mock-ups and prototypes and stuff like that floating around. Um, for us, since we're dealing with a bunch of native code, the Pigeon Bridge, this, uh, the bridge is really straightforward and robust. It actually hit 1.0 a few weeks ago. Drift is, I don't think we have anything quite like this in Python um, due to the ways that we deploy, the, just the sheer volume of, 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 of deployment possibilities, whereas Drift is um, pretty amazing for what it does. Uh, it's a, a SQLite persistence library, performs streaming updates, so you can sort of tune into uh, um, updates and queries. Um, really cool. RiverPod is for UX state management. Um, you know, is, as everything is essentially a single page application, well, state management's pretty much like the most important thing that um, that you're going to have to have for the for the UX, especially something that's really fluid and it's going to be reacting to lots of different events. Um, and the dependency management, I mean, um, you know, PIP is pretty primitive. It was, you know, it wasn't the first one, but it was pretty early on. Um, but the, the the Flutter sort of dependency management, you can tell they learned a ton from all the different prior work and it just really works well. The only thing that I've really seen is that probably one person out of four every once a month ends up getting a cache that gets corrupted or um, that you know makes the application act weird and you just sort of flutter uh, uh, Flutter pub cache clean or something like that, and then it, 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 it cleans that up. Um, it's very, very rare. In fact, I would, not even once a month. Um, and the add ons at pub.dev, really pretty awesome from form builders to lots of SaaS offerings to plug in. Google is not done the best with a lot of their widgets for Google Maps, but they're getting there. Um, and anything that is, um, oh, okay, well, wow. thank you very much. Uh, I didn't know that it's, uh, we have a few more minutes. Um, it seems to be pretty, it seems to be getting better, but um, the not so good parts is inconsistent sort of platform widgets, specifically sort of background uh, job processing uh, on Android. It's not, it's pretty primitive compared to um, uh, the iOS side. Um, another example is the way platform views work with PSPDF kit. On Android, it's full screen only, whereas on iOS, you can sort of fit it inside of the sort of panes to show uh, annotated and, and to actually annotate the PDFs. Dependency churn is, I'm not sure if you could consider this healthy, but I would imagine it could only be worse in, in, in React Native is that you know, every day we sort of, before stand up, we have someone who's running through the um, uh, pub update check or, or, or depth checks and looking for the dependencies. And pretty much uh, once every two to three days, we have a uh, minor dependency that's, up, uh, that's, that's incrementing. Um, so it's way more than we thought. The other really not so good part, Flutter themes are very underwhelming. They're completely half-baked. 
uh, they were designed without the, the team really knowing what they were doing. And so that was kind of problematic. They admit that and they're going to revisit it. Um, so the mobile app, we're still sort of wrap, what the state of it right now is, we're, we're wrapping up the remote file operations. We have delete working, we're adding add and this, that, and the other. Um, and we'll, then we have conflict resolution. After we deploy the app, we're gonna overhaul the UI. But right now we're just trying to get everything to be bulletproof. Um, uh, and again, one of the problems with the, the, the customers that will have, no custom, will have no client feedback, no one will talk to us, we'll release this app, um, we'll get very little feedback from anyone. We'll have to have our self-hosted uh, century that will provide our um, you know, crash reports. We'll end up having to add post hog at some point to drive analytics. But ultimately, there's not going to be any feedback <laughs> uh, that we'll be getting from the end users. So bulletproof it is. And even if we're sort of limiting the amount of features that go into it and the UI doesn't look terribly great. So here is sort of a quick view of it. Um, the sort of initial, <clears throat> so also it, it adjusts whether you're on a tablet or not or your mobile device. Um, and so when you load the app, we have it's a, nothing rocket science. Um, we have the initial screen, the recycle button uh, does performs this uh, sync, the little sun icon performs different display mode changes and the bottom bar, we have favorites settings and search. When we add manually a sync point, we can add OIDC, uh, Public token or public token information, uh, or basic off, or a, a client certificate. When we can edit an existing sync point, well, we can see some information. In this case, for the OIDC um, authentication, such as refreshing the token or sign out, but um, we can delete it. Um, file listing. You can you can scroll through these. Uh, the icons and the text show gray when they're sort of a ghost file i.e. there, we have the metadata in the virtual file system, but they actually aren't on disk. And then they turn uh, solid as the, 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 the gets occur and we load them on disk. And then colored dots indicate whether or not we've changed the document. Um, so an item detail view, sort of an extensible way, all everything has some sort of item view on it. Uh, search results, definitely no flaps just searching file, uh, file names right now, but we can sort of plug that in using uh, SQLite, uh, uh, using PS PDF kits, sort of text extraction and uh, just shoving it into uh, SQLite uh, full text search. Again, it's not really complicated, but really most people are only searching the file names. Again, this is sort of a pretty amazing because of uh, drift, because of, uh, the sort of state management, we actually are showing these results and they're changing as they you know go from ghost into solid without any sort of any sort of code that we have to specify. It's just all sort of the reactive mechanism. So again, the primary use case that we've solved, users have between 500 megabytes and four gigabytes of data they're synchronizing to the end user device. Bandwidth is highly variable. Um, a large percentage of customers will have devices, uh, we have certificates on their device. Others will use uh, credentials and uh, trust at one time. Um, at this point, uh, I wanna sort of um, take a break and actually quickly just sort of show, uh, ask, 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 ask anyone if they have any questions. Is that, is the questions part fit in right now? Can I? How do we do questions or do we do questions? We can do questions. Um, we do have a comment from Alessandro okay, uh, who had, sorry, let me just get it here. Uh, he said that he's using past plugins automatic with OIDC. Automatic. Okay, great. Yeah. I'll write and that I, down. And I don't believe there are any other questions for the moment, but uh, anyone who's listening, please go ahead and type your question into the Slido or into the Slack channel for track two, and I will relay them to Alan. Great. 
And then I'll just finish up these last two slides. So <clears throat> from the user facing side, what does the mobile app do? Basically provides multiple sync points for people to sync down containers that are identified on a remote server. We have different off modes. That's basic off, certificate, and OIDC. We perform full syncs across all sync points or individual sync points. We have a progress meter, favorite search, uh, ability to edit files using your own sort of uh, editor on disk, um, which you know, then we detect changes. We have foreground synchronization, background synchronization. Um, we can load the sync points in through a JSON file. So there's a, a way that when people walk up to Plone, they, they get this file and then press a button and all their sync points show up in the application. Uh, we're going to, we're embedding sort of PSPDF kit for the PDF annotation mechanism because PDFs are sort of one of the primary mechanisms that uh, sort of file formats are working with. And then we have various file type renderers using a mix of native integration as well as web renderers. So how the user gets the app in the real world, procurement gives the user an app, the MDM pushes a shortcut to Plone and the mobile app down to their device. The user clicks on the shortcut, it opens up Safari or Chrome, it requests Plone, Plone doesn't have a token, gets kicked over to Keycloak, it authenticates using uh, the X509 cert that's been pushed to the trust store, then redirects back to Plone uh, as logged in. The user has a setup wizard or ability to download their sync points. They select that, they download this .json file, they open up the mobile application, they click on load sync points, and they browse to the downloads directory on their local device to pick the .json file. So that is, um, that's it. Uh, we hope to open source some of the synchronization framework. That is pretty rock solid, um, useful. Um, we'd like to sort of open source parts of the transferring subsystem because what was out there in the world was good for, was not, didn't have granular enough controls for us. Um, and if you have any questions about Flutter, uh, have we built Flutter web apps? Yes, we did. And it did work as expected. This was not for the file sync app, but for a very basic REST API. Um, and converting it from a mobile app into a web app did take about four hours. And it worked just as we'd expect. You know, JavaScript payload, completely single page application, a little bit of a long load time in the start. Um, and the downside is that it looked exactly like the mobile app. Um, so really, if you're going to do any sort of web app in Flutter, you're really going to have to make another UI layout for the web, but it's not going to look, it's never going to be similar to a web site or like a React Native um, because it's really drawing the sort of widgets. And while you can deploy desktop apps on Flutter, using Flutter, um, Ubuntu, I believe, is writing some of their uh, new apps. Uh, I think their bootloader is a <laughs> bootloader, I think, is or, or some some part of Ubuntu uh, configuration. Uh, 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 one of their configuration programs is being run, being built in Flutter, um, and the um, OS X version and the Linux versions are the ones that are closest to being production worthy. The Windows one has a little bit lagging behind. But it has the Windows one actually has COM integration and all that stuff. So if you really want to build a, a first class <laughs> Windows web app using Flutter, um, it's not like, I mean, you're, it, it'll, be, it'll be difficult, but it's not impossible. Um, and there's quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of tooling for us to do that. So at this moment, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope that uh, this was somewhat instructive for someone or some provided some some uh, insight into developing a large app and um, please you can uh, at me as Runyaga R-U-N-Y-A-G-A on the Slack channels say hi um, and uh, everyone have a great weekend and rest of the conference thank you thank you Alan I hope you're going to have time to join everybody in the Jitsi
I'm going to post a link to it. I'll send it to you too, Ellen. Um, 